And now, without further ado, I'm going to welcome to the stage Professor Paul Komisaryov, the president of the Adult Medic Medical Division, to introduce the Cottrell Memorial Oration. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce um, Professor Suresh Sundram um, to give the Cottrell Memorial Lecture. lecture. Professor Sundram is Unit Head for Adult Psychiatry at Monash Medical Centre um, and works in the Department of Psychiatry in the School of Clinical Sciences at Monash University. He's been involved for 15 years in asylum seeker mental health and mental health service, um, developing systems for low and middle income countries. He also sat on the executive of the World Psychiatric Association section on developing countries. He's an expert consultant to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and has provided expert advice to the Australian Human Rights Commission, the Australian Department of Home Affairs and non-government organisations. He previously chaired the Health Subcommittee of the Joint Advisory Committee for the Governments of Australia and Nauru on Nauruan Regional Processing of Asylum Seekers and now serves as a bilateral independent advisor. He ran the psychiatry clinic at the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre for over a decade, providing pro bono psychiatric services to asylum seekers, and this year, with Cabrini, established the Cabrini Asylum Seeker and Refugee Health Hub. He has published and presented widely, nationally and internationally in this area. His other key focus of research is in psychiatric neuroscience, where he focuses on psychotic disorders, um, and in particular schizophrenia, using a broad translational approach. So in summary, Suresh is a person of rare intellectual vision, with his interests and his knowledge covering the clinic, research, and the ethical, philosophical, and cultural aspects of his discipline. And he's also a person of extraordinary personal courage and commitment, as demonstrated by his tireless work over many years in support of refugees and other oppressed people around the world. It is my very great pleasure to invite Professor Suresh Sundram to deliver the Cottrell Memorial Lecture. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for those very kind words, Paul. I think there are a couple of elements of the work that I'm going to present to you today which are very resonant with the contribution that Dr. Jack Cottrell has made to medicine uh, over many decades. The first is the public health aspect. The work that he did across a number of continents recognised the universality of health and that health and the right to health doesn't stop at any national border. The other element is about the recognition of the social factors which contribute to health, not in any single discipline, but in the generic contribution of health as a holistic concept uh, with regards to the well-being of the individual, the family, and the community. The work that I'll present today We'll follow the following uh, description. First, I'll give you some definitions and expand upon them as to what a refugee and asylum seeker is and the relevance of that within a broader international context. I'll provide you the current situation with regards what I think can only really be termed a refugee crisis, present to you the health implications of that, and then talk in more detail about the contextual factors around those health implications, in particular from perspective of where we live, and then finally make my concluding remarks. It's important that I put up this slide, which is my disclosure slide. I've highlighted the elements that are relevant. These are people who funded charitable and, and philanthropic trusts that funded my research. 
these are the agencies that uh, Paul mentioned previously that I've provided expert external consultation for. None of them have influenced my uh, talk today or contributed in any way. The nature of seeking refuge has been there since the dawn of human society and in fact may well have preceded that. There are good examples of non-human primates who've sought refuge with other social groups and it is clear that the concept of leaving either the individual or the group leaving their predetermined social group to seek refuge or asylum with another social group is historical from the very beginning of time. It is embedded and in fact enshrined in most of the, if not all, of the world's major religions and their whole of literature, the history of literature is replete with examples of exactly this. In fact, most religions espouse the host community in providing refuge and asylum for those who seek it. However, this reached a critical point in the aftermath of World War II in the context of the tens of millions of displaced peoples in Europe who were unable to return to their country of origin. The fledgling United Nations rose to the challenge. It built on the work of its predecessor, the League of Nations, and in 1951 was able to develop, implement, and ratify the 1951 UN or Geneva Convention on the Status of Refugees. This is a historical document which has had important ramifications throughout the subsequent 70 years and will continue, I think, to be an influential and, and important contribution to the way that we think of refugees. One of the key tenets of the 51 Convention was that it defined what a refugee was. The first characteristic is that a refugee must be outside the national boundary of their country or of his or her country. You can't be a refugee within your own country. If you're unable to live at home, you're termed an internally displaced person and it's only once you cross a national border that you can be considered for classification as a refugee. The second characteristic, which is the key characteristic, is that the individual must be unable or unwilling to return or to seek the protection of that country due to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. I just want to walk you through that definition because there are a couple of, or in fact, three key criteria within that. The first is being unable or unwilling. The second is that you have a well-founded fear. That fear doesn't need to be an actual, demonstrable, objective reality. It needs only to be a well-founded fear. And the third element are the categories with which one can be considered a refugee, that is race, religion, nationality, etc. It's not so much what is included in those categories as is what is excluded. You cannot be, for example, a victim of domestic violence. You cannot be, for example, someone who is at risk of slavery. Those characteristics do not qualify you as a refugee. The third element is that you can't be a war criminal. And that was because lots of Nazis escaping to South America then sought protection as, as refugees and didn't wish to be repatriated. It's of course got current resonance with people like Charles Taylor and, and other current uh, war criminals. To cover those elements which are not categorised as refugees, many countries, and I've got Australia here, but New Zealand as well, recognise a series of additional protocols and conventions. The first and most major one is the 1967 Protocol, which is an expansion of the Refugee Convention, really to take it outside Europe and to apply it as a global, uh, as a global convention. There are, in addition to that, a number of 
uh, covenants and a number of and a number of treaties that many countries, including Australia and New Zealand, are signatories to, which provide complementary protection. That means that you can, for example, uh, seek protection of a country even though you don't qualify as a refugee. That definition of complementary protection is equivalent in both Australia and New Zealand to being granted a protection visa, but in official terminology, you're not considered to be a refugee. An asylum seeker is simply an individual who has crossed a national boundary and is in the process of seeking to be identified as a refugee or to be identified on the grounds of complementary protection. That identification can be done either by an agency such as UNHCR or the national authorising agency of the government of the host country. So generally speaking, the departments of immigration would do those sorts of classifications. Uh, and at the end of that, if you're found to be owed protection, then uh, you can be considered to be a refugee or owed complementary protection. Now, the crisis that I was referring to. At this point in time, there are more refugees than at any time in the history of humanity. That 68 and a half million displaced persons that I've got on the, on the slide up there would, if it was a single nation, be number nine or 10 on the list of the world's most populous nations, somewhere around the size of the UK or France. The number of currently identified refugees, 25 and a half million, is greater than the population of Australia. The other 40 million are these internally displaced persons who wish to seek, uh, who aren't able to live in their home but are still within their national boundary. There are currently about 3 million asylum seekers. There are 10 million additional stateless persons. So, for example, Palestinians, those from the Western Sahara, they're classified as stateless people. At the moment, the Rohingyans are in a transitional space within that cohort. In 2017, there were almost two million new asylum claims. And where do these people come from? They come from the countries that all of us see every day in the international papers and in the international news. They come from Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan. And a couple of years ago, or 18 months ago, they came from Myanmar. The next two points I think are critical. More than half the currently displaced persons of the world are under the age of 18, and that has profound impacts upon their development, which I will hopefully spend some time telling you about in a moment. The additional aspect is that of those 35 million children, about 200,000 are unaccompanied. The displaced persons, the refugees, the asylum seekers of the world, we can be grateful, don't come to Australia or New Zealand. They go to the countries which are adjacent to their country, which are safe. They go to Turkey, they go to Lebanon, they go to Jordan, they go to Pakistan, they go to Uganda. 85% of the world's refugees are hosted by the developing world. 85%. I'll make a special noteworthy mention of Germany, which is the exception to this rule, when the Chancellor Angela Merkel opened the borders of Germany to the Syrian and Iraqi exodus, and Germany took about a million people into its borders to provide them sanctuary and refuge. The only uh, European nation, in fact, the only nation really that did that in a Western industrialized context. The next line, which you can see there, the 164, 71, 24, that refers to the number of refugees per head of population in those countries. What that says is that for every thousand Lebanese, there are 164 refugees that Lebanon is hosting. Sweden is the first Western industrialized nation on that list with 24. The next figure is a relative figure. This is an estimate of the cost, economic cost, 
to a country of hosting refugees. It can only really be seen in relative terms, and so the way to read this is that, for example, Democratic Republic of Congo is 471, Ethiopia is 453. The first Western industrialized nation is Russia at nine. So the way to read this is that Ethiopia carries 50 times the economic cost burden of hosting its refugee population compared to Russia. The next number is the number that the UNHCR feels it can settle in any one year. That number of 103,000 in 2017 was a major reduction from the couple of previous years, predominantly due to the leading resettling nation in the world, the US dramatically reducing the number of places it offered. Historically, the US has always been number one, Australia or Canada, number two or three on that list. In 2017, the US dramatically reduced its numbers, and I understand in 2018, Canada has now taken over the number one place with the US number two. These are the most critical cases, and these are the cases that really the UNHCR feels that it must resettle. But if you think about the number that the UNHCR resettling on an annual basis, and you think about the total number of refugees, you can immediately recognize that it's going to take somewhere in the order of about 250 years to settle them all. Now, there's a reason why Australia and New Zealand don't have much to do with refugees in any direct sense. Some of you may be familiar with this map. It's a Peters projection map. German cartographer Arno Peters developed it to accurately resemble the landmass areas of the world, unlike the Mercator projection map, which most of us are familiar with. The value of this map, of course, is to show you the true size of the world and also to show you the accurate depiction of distances. I want to highlight two places on this map. The first is Christmas Island. The second is Lampedusa, which is an island uh, that belongs to Italy. If you now look at where the major source of source countries of refugees are, places like Syria, places like Afghanistan, places like Libya, you can immediately see that as hazardous a journey as it is to Lampedusa or to Italy or to Greece or to Hungary, it doesn't compare to the hazards that are required, sorry, the hazards that are required to get to Christmas Island, Australia, and heaven help us, New Zealand. This is the reason why Australia and New Zealand can afford to be so selective in their approach to the refugee crisis. The figure that I've got there are the number of places that Australia and New Zealand offered. And if you can read that, that number is 0.75 per 1,000 head of population for Australia and 0.2 per 1,000 head of population for New Zealand. And we want to look at that figure of the cost of a refugee per uh, economic cost for Australia it's 0.36, and for New Zealand, it's 0.035. Sorry, I keep doing that. If you now look at what those figures are with regards to those countries I had before, 164 for Lebanon per thousand, DRC 471, means that the Democratic Republic of Congo is carrying 1,200 times the economic cost of refugees for the globe compared to Australia, and in the order of 12,000 times the cost that New Zealand is carrying. So I want to now shift tack and to talk about the implications of health from a refugee and asylum seeker perspective and the implications of this for us and in particular for people that we may come across but I want you to remember those figures because this is not an Australian problem or a New Zealand problem. This is a global problem. 
The way that I think about health with regards to refugees and asylum seekers is to think about it in a five-fold uh, matrix. The five domains refer to what the pre-migration experience of the refugee or asylum seeker is. In other words, what is it that has driven them from their country of origin? What has driven them from their home to the extent that they would seek uh, protection somewhere else, somewhere foreign? Allied to that is what their pre-migration health experience is. That is critically important because those factors will impact upon their post-migration health. The next element refers to the migration journey or transit. How easy or hard has it been? What have been the travails that the individual or the family have experienced in moving from their country of origin to seek protection in another country? The post-migration environment, which is of particular relevance in an Australian context, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then the one element which many of us will tend to underestimate what are the strengths, resiliences, vulnerabilities, social resources that an individual or a family can bring to bear upon the stresses that they will invariably experience as a consequence of those other factors? And the mediation of those stresses becomes in many ways the primary determinant of their health outcomes. So pre-migration and migration. This is relatively self-evident for most of you, and you, most of you can imagine what this is about. But the pre-migration experience is not as straightforward as having your house bombed or your family killed. It places upon the individual a very difficult decision as to whether or not they should forsake their country of origin, the country that they identify with that gives them their ethnic, cultural, linguistic, religious identity, that gives them all the qualities that makes them who they are, and they often feel that it's a betrayal. It's a leaving behind of family, a leaving behind of community, that they are, in a sense, betraying those elements which they hold most dear. And that's what I mean by the agony of choice. It's different for different people and it's of differing intensity for many people, but it's an issue, a point that they all contemplate. The notion of war, the notion of conflict is self-evident. Torture is relatively uncommon as a direct experience. Um, However, the experience of trauma is pervasive. Unfortunately, rape has been, come increasingly prominent as a weapon of war uh, with women, with children, with men, uh, and has profound consequences, as you could imagine. I've mentioned traumatic losses. Everybody that I see, all refugees will describe a traumatic loss of some sort. Atrocities and the witnessing of atrocities uh, or being forced to commit atrocities is a common characteristic. Having left or having made the decision to leave and leaving your country of origin, you then don't necessarily face a simple process. It may be as simple as getting on an aeroplane and landing in a major airport in New Zealand or in Australia, and it can be as simple as that for people. However, for very many refugees and asylum seekers, it's an extraordinarily difficult and challenging journey. They may spend time in uh, transit nations where they may be abused, where they may be subjected to violence, where they may be subjected to criminal acts. Refugee camps where, again, there is no rule of law. People will experience significant uh, deprivation in camps. Children in particular are especially vulnerable to these types of factors. And then, of course, in even getting to a place like Christmas Island, which is so close to Indonesia, can afford extraordinarily um, unpleasant and uh, difficult circumstances in the, in the transit journey. The post-migration trauma is the experience that the individual has once they've arrived in their host 
or supposedly host nation. Many asylum seekers, in fact all asylum seekers, would be subjected to a refugee determination process, and I'll come to that in a moment in terms of the impacts of that upon the health of the individual. Many asylum seekers are faced with the prospect of immigration detention. All unauthorised maritime arrivals in Australia are mandatorily and indefinitely detained, and I'll spend some time talking about that. And then the hostility and discrimination that the mainstream community may uh, express towards asylum seekers and refugees. I've got here a couple of media headlines. This, for those of you who don't know, uh, is the current Minister for Home Affairs in Australia, uh, Peter Dutton, who uh, has expressed quite a number of times his distaste for the asylum seeking process and for asylum seekers uh, doing things such as taking jobs from Australians. That level of discrimination and hostility, of course, is not universal, and it's important to emphasise it's not universal. There are many communities in Australia, and I'm sure in New Zealand, who welcome asylum seekers and refugees and provide them with a compassionate and uh, humanitarian uh, response to their plight. However, with headlines like this, it can be very difficult for people to experience that at a personal level. Immigration detention. Paul's mentioned that I've uh, spent time working in immigration or, or certainly observing immigration detention facilities. Australia reopened its offshore immigration uh, detention centres. It has a set of onshore detention centres as well. At the moment, they're comparatively underpopulated. Most, there are very few people in those detention centres. However, the two major centres which have caused enormous concern uh, to the health community, to doctors and, and other health professionals, have been the two offshore centres, one in Nauru, one on Manus Island. The reason I put this map up is just to show you the distance from Australia to Nauru and to Manus Island. That's the island of Nauru. It can fit inside Melbourne Tullamarine Airport grounds. It's about 21 square kilometres. And these are pictures of the Manus Island uh, detention centre or regional processing centre. This is currently where uh, people are living in, in Manus Island. And actually, to be fair, it's not a bad facility, even though it doesn't look particularly encouraging or inviting in that photograph. These data are data which were collected by the former director of mental health services for the private service provider contracted to provide health services to these offshore detention centres. IHMS was the company. Peter Young is the name of the psychiatrist. Peter was so, I think appalled is not uh, putting it too strongly, at what he ended up seeing, that he published these data, uh, not quite in contravention of the Border Force Act, but he published these data and he shared them with me a couple of years before he did that. What I really want you to see here is that this is the Kessler 10 scale. So this is the, a very brief scale for the measurement of depression. Brown is bad, blue is good. This is the time spent in detention and you can see a very nice dose response curve where the more time people spend in detention, the more depressed they get. The brown meaning essentially that they meet or were likely to meet criteria for major depression. I want you to look at the number down here, which is 19 months, or just over 19 months. People now in detention are in excess of 60 months. The other data that Peter shared with me, or that I'm showing you here, is another scale, which is the Health of the Nation Outcome Scale. This is a broad measure of well-being. And what I want to show you here is that this is the Australian mainstream adult population. This is the score for people who are receiving public psychiatric services in Australia. And this is the score for the average adult in either Nauru or Manus Island. Sorry for the detail in this slide. This slide is a 
study that uh, UNHCR commissioned, I led a, a medical mission to Manus Island in 2016 to measure the level of psychiatric and uh, morbidity and, and health morbidity in the detained population. Um, this data was not meant to be publicly shared, but UNHCR was so uh, surprised by it that they read the entire report into the Senate submissions, so it's on Hansard, and then subsequently we've been able to publish it. I just want you to draw your attention to that first column. What that's essentially showing you is that 79% of the sample that we surveyed, which was about 20% of the overall uh, detained population, met diagnostic criteria for PTSD. About 80% uh, met diagnostic, or just under 90% met diagnostic criteria for major depression, and about 93% met diagnostic criteria for one or both disorders. That's amongst the highest rates that have ever been recorded in a population. This is a study that one of my postdoctoral fellows did, Deb Hocking, which looks not at detained asylum seekers, but asylum seekers living in the community in Melbourne. And the numbers are of the same order of magnitude, but actually a little bit less. So asylum seekers meeting a diagnosis of depression about 60%, PTSD about 50%. People who'd been very recently asylum seekers but granted protection, you can see an immediate drop in those figures. And I'll come to that data in a moment again. The way that I think about the consequences of these processes, the pre-migration, the migration, post-migration experiences, and the experience of the asylum seeker in the community is in the following way. I don't think that there is a comparable equivalent uh, that's been recently described. What in fact I think we can see here is this chronic state of prolonged stress with acute episodes of distress, which I've termed the dialectic of hope and hopelessness. Asylum seekers need to maintain hope because that's the only thing that they have left, but they are confronted by experiences of hopelessness, repeated experiences of hopelessness. And so what we find is that they have, in a sense, a preserved centre of hope surrounded by a sea of hopelessness. And this, over time, destroys their resilience in combination with feeling profoundly powerless. This creates really a, a series of phases, psychological phases, which I've termed a honeymoon phase, a transition phase, an emergent phase, and a desperation phase. The honeymoon phase is really the initial experience, which can be a positive experience of find, finding or arriving somewhere that they believe will be safe for them, where they can finally resume their life. That phase will commonly pass quickly. It passes more quickly in immigration detention than in the community. And it passes to a phase of transition where people doubt the decision to have left. Was it the right thing to do? That entry of doubt focuses upon the guilt of those left behind, about the uncertainty of the choice of the country that they've made, and they begin to fear the fact that they may be repatriated. Over time, people will then develop psychiatric disorder in the way that I've described, in particular, major depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD is not current PTSD, it's for the traumas that they've experienced previously, which are now being re-emerging because their resilience to resist those traumas has been eroded. And eventually what happens is that this becomes ubiquitous. There are Within that, a number of anomalous characteristics, which I won't talk about, but in particular, this maintenance of hope in a profoundly depressed patient can be very confronting and distressing for the physician that sees this patient um, and can be quite terrifying as well, both for the patient and for the physician. And then finally, when that hope begins to break down, we begin to see the psychosis emerging, and this is the truly pitiful state that quite a number of people, uh, in particular in offshore regional processing centres, have arrived at. They become withdrawn, 
listless, non-communicative. They experience dissociative psychoses, which are terrifying for their um, friends and, and uh, for the health professionals that are looking after them. I just want to briefly mention mental disorders in children. I'm not a paediatrician or a child psychiatrist, but I really want to emphasise this notion of loss, which for children becomes profound in terms of their developmental trajectory, the loss of security, the loss of stability, the loss of parental figures, not just in an overt physical sense, but with the destruction of the resilience in parents and the emergence of mental disorders, parents are unable to provide the appropriate and suitable parenting for their children. The loss of social contact, social structures, and the loss of educational time. There's been very little research that's been done on um, asylum seeker children. These are some of the data which we're currently putting together for a, a systematic review. We've had a look at older asylum seekers. They're a small group in the Australian context, only about 1.5% are over the age of 60. They experience very high rates of PTSD and major depression, like the adults, the, the younger adults, if you like. They have additional whole sets of losses. Um, and if they have, in a sense, become more crystallised in their intelligence, their ability to adapt is reduced, making the challenges even greater for them. But there is hope. This is uh, another study that uh, Deb Hocking has done. When we looked at what the impact of time living in the community were on the mental health of asylum seekers, we found very encouragingly, very significant declines in the rate of mental disorders, both PTSD, major depression, and other mental disorders just by living in the community. That is no longer in detention, just living in the community. And that was dependent on three factors. One factor was access to health, that is Medicare in Australia, public health access. The second was the right to work. You didn't need to have a job, you just needed to have the right to work. And the third was the more rejections you had, the more likely you were to experience PTSD. So, rejections through the formal authorising process became a major corrosion on resilience. I just want to finish by putting up this slide. This is a very old slide now done by a Guardian journalist in 2014. This is the cost to the Australian taxpayer of keeping one person in an offshore regional processing centre. This is the cost to the Australian taxpayer of keeping one person in the Australian community. That's $850,000. That's just under $20,000. So in conclusion, asylum seekers display high rates of mental disorder, especially PTSD and major depression, and a high level of comorbidity. The rates are much higher in detained cohorts than community cohorts. That there is a trajectory of that psychological state, as I've mentioned, that the prolonging of the refugee determination process is an important perpetuating factor, and however, the factors which predict outcome are detention, the number of rejections, work rights, and healthcare access, all socially determined factors, and that improvements in the community under normalised conditions are very clear and significant. This obviously has implications, very profound implications for health policy um, for both our countries. Just like to finish by acknowledging the people who've done the work with me, in particular Deb Hocking, who is a postdoctoral um, research fellow and, and uh, graduate student with me. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Suresh. It's a very sad, disturbing story, isn't it? And it raises some very profound questions, both about the nature of our own societies that can allow such things to happen, but also about the responsibilities that we bear, um, both as individuals and within our professional societies, to try to do something about it. Um, Suresh, I'd like to present you with the Cottrell Memorial Lecture and to thank you once again for your lecture. Thank you.